I'm originally from the state of North Carolina, although the eastern part, I'm currently in western North Carolina, which is truly home to me, the Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. So greetings from Unity of the Blue Ridge this morning. It's a joy to be here. And a special just thank you for this beautiful Mother's Day. And so whether you are a mother or whether you had a mother, however that mother showed up, we just give thanks for that mothering spirit that is present when we can be available to that. So I want to talk to you today a little bit about what it means to really feel nurtured and supported by all that is, the universe, God, whatever we may call it, and then to therefore be a presence of support. How many of you consider yourself a supportive presence or a supportive person? How many of you consider yourself really fully supported, that you feel supported? And how many of you know that you could probably turn up the volume and, and increase in one or, or another or maybe both of those areas? I think we all could. So we're going to talk about that some today. There's a powerful story about a man who moved into a new neighborhood, a historical, some historical beautiful homes. And he made a practice of every morning when he got up, he would go for an early morning walk. There was one house in particular that just had beautiful flowers and gardens and he would stop on his walk and just really take in the beauty of the, the plants, the flowers, the gardens. One morning as he was walking and he stopped to take in that beauty, he saw a, a woman working in the garden and she stood up and he said, hi, I'm new in the neighborhood and I love walking and I love to stop at this place every morning because he said, wow, these are just beautiful gardens. Look at these beautiful gardens that God is growing here. And she said, yeah, and you should have seen it when God was the only one taking care of this garden. <laughs> that, that. The message of that story that we know is that we are the place that God shows up. That we are the hands, the feet, the presence. I like to say that we are the place where God comes to life. That God's spirit, all that is, has all this power and potentiality, but it is going to be there as pure potential unexpressed until we just open up and, and express that. So I'm going to invite you to turn to someone this morning and express that spirit and say, I'm glad you're here, but this is for me. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, but this is for me. There's a beautiful scripture that where Paul is talking to Timothy. It comes up in 2 Timothy, and he says, I want to remind you to stir up the gift of God that is within you. And I grew up in the Pentecostal tradition, and I learned a lot of scriptures. And, as I, and later in my life, as I began to, what I grew up with really didn't meet my needs, didn't serve me. And I just let it all go. It's as if the universe began to speak to me and to teach me. And one morning, I woke up early one morning, and I heard that scripture, but I heard it slightly differently. I heard, stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. The gift of God within Stir up the gift of life. Stir up the gift of God within. And to stir that up is to really realize that we are in cooperation, that we are the ones that are tending the gardens. We are the ones that are, are making sure that love is being expressed in action. There's a beautiful um, story in the Gospel of Luke that I think just really I resonate and it shares this. And in this particular story, it's the story of two sisters, Mary and Martha. And as the story goes in the, in the uh, Gospel of Luke, it says that Jesus, this master teacher, had been teaching and, and was traveling. And so it, in, in Luke chapter 10, it says, Jesus and his disciples were on their way, and he came to a village where a woman named Martha invited him into her home. She opened him up her home for him. Martha had a sister named Mary, and Mary sat at Jesus' feet, listening to what he had to say. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. How many of you can relate to Martha? Do we have any doers out there? Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made, and so she came to Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you care that my sister has left me 
to do all the work. Tell her to get up off of her pillow and help me. <laughs> tell her to, okay, I'm rephrasing. It's what it says a little bit, but <laughs> it says, tell her to help me. Don't you care? Have you ever tried to tell the God of your being what to do and how to do it and when to do it and, and what your plans were? Tell her, can't you see I'm doing all this work? Tell her to help me. And the reply comes, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen something better and that cannot be taken away from her. And then that's the end of the story. And if that were me, I would be standing there saying, well, I'm just about as happy as I can be for Mary. But what about me? Well, in Unity, we look at these scriptures metaphysically, symbolically, and we realize that the characters represent characteristics of our nature, our, our spiritual nature, and that each of them, Mary and Martha, represent something that all of us have. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. These represents a dimension, a characteristic of your spiritual nature expressing as a human being, and that we all have the Mary quality within us. What was the name of Jesus' mother? Mary. What is the, the character in this story who is, who is present and available and making space? It is Mary. Mary is that aspect of each and every one of us that, that makes space. It's that place of inner receptivity. You know, it's that part of us that is engaged through prayer and meditation, through be still and know. And it's an absolutely essential aspect of who we are to be willing to, to make space. But then there's also the Martha. You see, the Martha represents the, the outer expression. And the key to this story is it's just about, it's, it's what the Buddhists would call right action. That we will find ourselves frustrated. We will find ourselves resentful. We will find ourselves tired if we're not balancing the qualities of being receptive and being expressive. And this day, I think, is a perfect day to just ask ourselves, where do I need perhaps a little fine-tuning? Do I need to go within a little more and, and make time to be nurtured and blessed? Do I need to fill my own cup? Or am I spending a lot of time on the meditation cushion? Am I spending a lot of time in that particular posture? And maybe it's time for me to get up, to be of service, to be the hands, to be the feet, to be that love in action. So today I want to share with you three ways I enjoy. I had the pleasure of serving Unity of Maui in Hawaii, and I got to study that indigenous culture. I've also studied the Native American culture, and I found an interesting um, thing that both of those cultures share about how do we express our spiritual potential. And it says that we all need three things, and that the three things we need are something to love, something to believe in, and something to do. And so today I want to look at that with you in the context of how to engage this part of us that is both receptive and expressive. Charles Fillmore wrote when he talked about this, he said, the realization that the almighty God of the universe is a spiritual presence which is constantly striving to express in and through you can fill you with a fearlessness that is beyond description to stir up the realization that God within is seeking to express through each and every one of us. And so the first thing that helps us engage this is to realize we all need something to love. And to, weigh that, to make that active is to say, we all need to do what you love and love what you do. I loved it when your, one of your board members, Linda Ray, picked me up at the airport. She, as part of what she does, she teaches cheerleading camps. And I said, gosh, every minister would like to have a cheerleading teacher on their team, that a person who's born to help other people become enthused. And I could tell she loved it. How many of you love what you do? Be it your job, be it the way you volunteer, be it the way you carry out your life. And do you do what you do with love? Are you mindful in, in doing that? There's uh, the great Howard Thurman said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go and do that. Because what the world needs, 
are people that have come alive. Amen? When you say at this particular time, we need some people that have come alive. There's a true story about Sir Christopher Wren. Sir Christopher Wren was one of the most well-known British architects. And back in, I want to say it was in the 1600s, 1666, through London, there was the Great Fire, and it destroyed much of, um, of London. Sir Christopher Wren was personally responsible for rebuilding 52 of the, of the churches, of the temples there. The great St. Paul's Cathedral was one of his works that he built. But he had a practice. What Sir Christopher Wren would do is he would walk around the job site. You know, there's a television show now. What is it, like Undercover Boss? Anybody seen that where the boss just shows up? Well, I think Sir Christopher Wren invented that in the 1600s because he would walk around his job sites without letting people know who he was and just talk to him, see how things were going. One particular day, he saw three individuals doing the same thing. They were all working on building doors. And he asked the first person, he said, so um, what are you making? And the person stood up and said, well, I make about a shilling a day. He told him how much money he made. He said, oh. He went over to the next person. He said, so, so what are you making? And he said, so I'm, I'm making a door. Okay. And he saw another person doing the exact same thing. And he said, so what are you making? And that individual stopped and stood up and said, Sir, haven't you heard? I am making the greatest cathedral the world has yet to see. Three people doing the same thing. Who was bringing a quality of love to that that was truly palpable? That's why I first saw Ellis sing last night, and I thought she could not keep the light of God inside of her if she tried. It was <laughs> oozing out of every pore of her being. That's doing what you love and loving what you do, and it's positively contagious. And so do you do what you love, and do you love what you do? And are you willing to, to make space to, to find and connect with that presence of love so that you can imbue it? in whatever you're doing. The second thing then is we all need something to believe in. The way that we would make that active is to say, do what you believe in and believe in what you do. That also happens to be a powerful recipe for integrity. For if you believe in what you do and do what you believe in, how many of you have ever had a job or been asked to do something that you didn't feel good about? It does not feel good, and you don't enjoy showing up. But how many of you have been able to do something that you believed in with all your heart? It causes you just to stand a little taller, that you, you really do something with a level of joy and enthusiasm. When I was the minister at Unity of South Sound in the Pacific Northwest, and I was flying, um, I don't even remember the airline, but I was flying one time back to my home of North Carolina, and I picked up one of those airline magazines just to read. And I read this really telling story about a, a farmer in the Pacific Northwest. They're really known for apples. They produce a lot of apples. And this particular farmer was, was prided himself and was known for producing a huge quantity of apples and some of the best apples that were said to exist. Well, this particular year, the weather had been challenging and there had been a lot of hail storms. And his apple crop had been pounded by hail. And so almost every apple had some kind of blemish or mark. And so here's this man that loves what he does, he does what he loves, and he believes in what he does and does what he believes in. But he's faced with a dilemma because he's already pre-sold his crop. The money has come in and he does not have it to give back and he's got apples with dings and marks on them. So he said he thought about trying to buy somebody else's crop and sell that, but then that wouldn't feel, he wouldn't be in integrity. So when all else failed, he decided to pray. Have you ever said, oh my God, has it come to that? It's time to, to pray. <laughs> he decided to pray. And when he prayed, this answer came, look, you believe in them. They just, they're not that pretty, but they're still good. And so he sat down and he wrote this card that he had printed, which he put in every shipment. And it said, note, the hail marks that have caused minor skin blemishes on some of these apples they are proof of their growth at high mountain altitude where sudden chills from hailstorms help firm flesh develop. 
It develops fruit sugars and gives, gives these apples their incomparable flavor. Well, he put one of those in every box. That was a great idea. Not one single person, not one single supplier asked to, for them to be returned. And as a matter of fact, what he was writing in that article is the next year he had specific requests for the apples with hail marks on them. <laughs> so when all hail breaks loose, there's even um, a way to stay and to be in integrity. Do what you love, love what you do. Do what you believe in and believe in what you do. And then the third one is we all need something to do. So that is to do what is yours to do in a way that serves both God and humanity. If you want to really ignite your calling, if you want to really ignite your unique gifts, if you really want to ignite your higher presence and potential, then whatever you do, do it in service of both God, however you know this God, and humanity. You see, Mary and Martha, it's about being present to the God of our being, and it's about serving humanity. We're here to do both. I don't know about you, but I still read the news, and it's a great big prayer list these days. I still turn on the television, and it's a great big prayer list these days. Our world needs people that are going to be informed and know what's going on, not put our head in the ground, but rise up and say, there is another way. There is another way to do this, and it's a way that is filled with love and light and integrity, and that's what we're here to do. Yeah, amen. To do what you love and love what you do. Do what you believe in and believe in what you do. And do what's yours to do in service of God and humanity. Oprah Winfrey says, I get up every morning and start my day saying, use me. Use me. Before my ministry career, I was a, a national sales manager for a children's toy company. And I traveled in Scandinavia, all over the United States. And I had my plans. I had my vision of what my life would look like. But I also had this little inkling that was saying, you're not playing full out. You're holding back. I worked for a children's toy company and one day I was in New York City and I happened to be in the famous FAO Swartz. I was there on business. I had just walked in the store and I was going to find the store manager and I was walking through this woman came up with a little girl and she said, can you help me find? And she started to ask for something. And I said, well, I don't work here, but I can, let me help find someone that can help you. She was on such a mission, she did not even hear that. So she began to tell me something that I knew was important. So I just stopped. And she said, this is my granddaughter, Maddie. And a little girl, probably about four years old. And she said, Ever since Maddie has been able to pull herself up, she would come to my house and she said, I have a beautiful curio of dolls that I have collected from around the world. They're very expensive dolls. And she said, I've given do Maddie dolls to play with, but she always crawls over and when she could stand up, she'd climb up and put her hands all over that glass and she wants those dolls. And I just say, honey, those aren't the dolls you play with. And I'd redirect her to one she could play with. And she said, this morning she came over and like she always does, she went straight to the curio, but this time she put her hands behind her back. She said, I didn't notice at first. And I just said, well, honey, remember you don't play with those dolls. And she said, I know grandma, mama told me when you die, I can have all those dolls. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I was mortified that my four-year-old granddaughter said that. And she said, in that moment, it got me. She said, I thought, oh my Lord, what else have I had locked away for no good reason? If not now, when? And if not me, for God's sakes, who? She said, I flung the door open of that curia and said, baby, which one do you want? <laughs> she said, and, and here's the one she wants. And I hope you have clothes and shoes and everything for this baby doll because we're going to go home and play with it. And so I helped her find someone and she walked away. And there I stood in FAO Swartz in New York City crying <laughs> because that, what got me was, Darlene, what are you waiting for? What if not now, when? You know what's yours to do. 
and you know it's yours to do. And so I ask you this day, is there any part of your life that you still have behind glass? Is there any part that you haven't yet made available to the God of your being? Is there any way that you feel like, well, I'm not yet ready to be in service, or maybe I'm, I'm worn out and I'm tired of being in, in service? I want to sing a song to allow you to just learn to use this song to help ground you in remembering that we all need something to love. So do what you love and love what you do. We all need something to believe in, so do what you believe in and believe in what you do. And we all need something to do. So be willing to do what's yours to do in a way that serves God and humanity. The words of the song are very simple. It's, I am here to reveal the divine. You'll catch on very quickly and please sing with us. I am here to reveal the divine. You are here. Sing it with us. You are here to reveal the divine. You and you and you and you and you, you are here to The divine, we are, lift your voice. We are here to reveal the divine. We invite you to close your eyes and to know that I am that I am the great I am that which is beyond any form that which is beyond any limitation that which is beyond any boundary I am that I am has sent you has created you and has imbued and given its life force to you operating through you and as you And just as sure as every form of creation has within it the perfect pattern of potential that will bring forth its potential, so it is with you and with me. We have within us this perfect pattern, this divine seed that we call the Christ, but is known by many names. That This divine seed and the whole Holy Spirit of life are seeking to bloom you into the fullness of your potential. And so... It asks, will you be receptive? Will you make time to allow the impression of spirit to inform you, to touch you, to heal you, to speak to you? And then will you take daily action, right action, action that is grounded in love, as loving as you can muster in that moment? Action that is grounded in integrity, that you believe in what you're doing. And to be willing to do those things that we know, what's mine to do? And may it be in service of God and humanity. You have within you the capacity to love, for you are love. You have within you the capacity to believe, for you are spirit. And you have within you the capacity to do, to be of service, for you are presence. You are the
are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And you are needed now for such a time as this. So with your eyes closed, I just invite you to ask your liver to smile. With your eyes closed, ask your lungs to smile. With your eyes still closed, ask your heart to smile. And now ask your face if it would be so kind as to follow and smile as well. And then when you're ready to open your eyes. And I am here to reveal the divine. Just stand up. You are. You are here to reveal the divine. You are here to The divine. Now I want you to move out until you join hands with those around you. Cross the aisles and join the space. Unite your voice until we are, we are here to reveal the divine. All right, no holding back. Lift your voice. Here we go. We are. We are here to divine yes we are we are we are here to reveal the divine lift your hands and look around take it in we and on someone's shoulder, I am. And I am here to reveal the divine. Yes, I know it's true. you to tell one person again I'm glad you're here but like I said this was for me <laughs> <laughs>